Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes round to the north. Round and round goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they use, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and others avoiding it is the same desire in both, to be happy. This is the motive of every action of every man. So said French philosopher Blaise Pascal now nearly 400 years ago. Well, what's changed? Do you, do I want to be happy? I know the answer, as do you. We all want to be happy. And we don't feel like this is asking too much, is it? We think, surely we can be happy. And yet, it is hard to come by. So we work diligently, as best we can, putting effort into, well, career or relationships or experiences. But still, this joy is elusive. And even when we find ourselves smiling just for that moment, well, blink, and it's gone. Now, all that is true. And yet, at the same time, humanity is determined to be miserable. Yes, determined. Offer the world joy, it will resist it forcefully. It will refuse with defiance to go the way that will surely bring joy. Now when mention is made of this book of Ecclesiastes, for many it brings to mind meaningless or futility, emptiness, nihilism. The view is out there, this is a profoundly depressing book. And yes, Ecclesiastes does, and we'll see that it will, relentlessly force our attention on truths about this world and about ourselves that we would rather ignore. But the aim of the book is in fact joy and pleasure and happiness, true joy, true pleasure, true happiness. And we're not talking here about joy in the grit your teeth, hang on for that little bit longer, and there might be a slice of pie in the sky for you when you die. No, we're talking about deep joy in the right now. So let me ask, are you seeking joy, really? Well, listen in. So who wrote this book of Ecclesiastes? You'll see the opening line tells us that Ecclesiastes contains the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. You may know it was Solomon who followed his father as king in Jerusalem. Solomon, a renowned man of wisdom. So to some, many take that Solomon is therefore the author of Ecclesiastes. And indeed, much of this book may well come from him. Although it is striking, he's not named in the book. Instead, we get this enigmatic title in that first line, Preacher. 
So this preacher may have been Solomon himself, or maybe a later individual who includes wisdom from Solomon, alongside maybe other wisdom from more kings in the line of David. Whoever it was, as we have it, this preacher has put together for us this book of Ecclesiastes. It's in the scriptures, which means this is what God wants to say to us today. So what is the book's message? Well, some here I know have been reading it in advance to remind yourselves what's in it. And you'll know, what is the book's message is a far from straightforward question to answer. And that is actually part of the point. The answer to the issues this book raises almost too well, the answers, if you like, even to life itself are not straightforward. So the preacher opens with this striking declaration in verse two. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That is a bold, stark statement with which to start your book. Notice there five times in that one verse, vanity, all is vanity. And it gets our attention because it also strikes a chord. There are moments at the very least when we feel this vanity, frustration and emptiness, the futility of life and what we do. And that sense is very much included in what our preacher means as he writes. But it is just worth being aware, this word vanity here is the word that our Bible has chosen to translate, the Hebrew word hevel. Now, confusingly, that's written in English, as you'll see on the sheets, as if it has a B in the middle, but you pronounce it with a V, hevel. And this word hevel appears nearly 40 times in this book. It is key to the message of Ecclesiastes, but what does it really mean? Well, we can start with what the word, if you like, hevel literally means, and it means breath or vapor or mist. The psalmist says this, man is like a breath, his days are like passing shadow. Well, that breath there is this hevel. So it turns out the preacher is using the word to describe more than merely a physical phenomenon. But that is a good place to start. So think of breath and mist and vapor. Notice those aren't entirely negative realities. In fact, in their place, they could even be beautiful. So this translation we've got here of vanity, others say meaningless. Now they very much do convey something of what the writer means by hevel but there's also probably more we need to think about as we go through this book. But let's start then with that literal meaning of vapor or mist. I thought it might be helpful this afternoon to bring us a visual aid. So I got up early one crisp morning. I headed down to the lake just as the sun was rising. Can you picture the scene? It was beautiful. The mist was there over the water. So I took my bottle to collect some of the mist for us, but it was elusive. I stretched out my hand and it disappeared. I tried to take hold of it, but it just slipped through my fingers. In fact, I suddenly looked up and it had all gone. I was wondering, had it even been there at all? But that's what Hevel is like. Can't quite make it out. It's there, but then it's gone. It doesn't seem to leave a mark or a trace, candle in the wind. Like I said, vanity is not a bad translation, so we will use it, but maybe once in a while we'll throw in hevel just to remind us we are also trying to work out what our writer, our preacher means. And we do need to know, because of verse two, vanity of vanities is the message. All is vanity. So the writer, the preacher, has got our attention. But now he wants to set the agenda with the question of verse three. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? We all know that life is full of it. Toil, hard work, labor. Now that includes paid work we might have, but also, if you like, all that we do. Raising children, caring for relatives, pursuing and maintaining relationships, keeping on top of paperwork, admin, all the planning ahead, all these sorts of ways. Our lives are full of toil, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And so the preacher poses this question, why? Why do we toil? 
Now, I've been reading this autobiography. It's of the comedian David Mitchell, who I quite like. And uh, for him, since a teenager, his dream was to be a comedian. And in this book, he describes how he worked for years and years to get there. And it's fair to say today he has. He has achieved success and money and awards and fame. Towards the end of the book, he comments... It all seems so trivial. Why work so hard for your exams? Why push on in the career? Why pay off the mortgage? Why work to raise children? Why do so much to try and make the most out of life? 24 times in this book, the preacher will speak of toil. What does man gain? by all the toil at which he toils under the sun. And of course, even before the preacher goes any further, we already sense the answer to his question. It's not meant to be difficult. We realize what he's getting at, although we'd rather not admit it. We don't want our thinking to stray towards what is actually uncomfortable and unsettling. I wonder if you've ever been up any of these tall buildings near us here. Some of you have offices, I know, high up. But up there, you look down on the square mile on the city, and you see all these workers like ants scurrying around from one meeting to another. On ground level, there's lots of stress. The presentation they're about to give, the difficult conversation they need to have, the annual target they are busting to meet. But up there, as you just look down on it all, Well, you just can't help but wonder, does all this frenetic activity really matter? Does it actually make a difference? What is it achieving in the end? But then we come down the lift, return to ground level, we put those questions out of our minds and off we go again, toiling. But the preacher's aim in Ecclesiastes, if you like, is not to allow us to do that. Not to get away with superficial answers. He is really going to make us, if you like, square up to this question. What are we living for? For all our efforts, will there in the end be any gain for us? The preacher's method now is to give us an opening poem in the rest of our reading, verses 4 to 11. And it's a series of observations, really, on life in our world. And he starts by describing for us the way things change. So verse 4, a generation goes and a generation comes. Just we are surrounded by change on the slightly bigger scale. This whole generation rises up, it passes through, then replaced by another, this constant churn. And that reflects the pattern we then see in the creation around us. Verse 5, the sun. There's a brand new day. We enjoy the sun during it, but then it gets darker. It comes to an end. But then the sun goes round and it starts all over again. Verse 6, the wind. It blows this way, it blows that way, it goes round and round, and on it goes. Verse 7, all streams run into the sea. And not far from here, there is a rather large stream called the Thames. And did you know that on average, 200 cubic metres of water flows downstream every second in the Thames? Or put it this way, five Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water every minute. Such change right next to us here in London. So much change. And yet, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Verse 4, again, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. And as we think about this and read on, we begin to realize The constant change is what stays the same. There's one day, new, but then another, and another. Same old, same old. So yes, the wind goes round and round, but it keeps going round and round. Same old, same old. Then that water, such a huge amount heading downstream all the time. But notice, the river doesn't dry up. The sea doesn't fill up. On it goes. A never-ending water cycle. We begin to wonder, in the midst of such change, does anything really change? Same old, same old. 
At the Glynn family, we are looking forward to our summer break, which will be near the sea. Every year now, for over 15 years, we have gone to exactly the same spot. It's good that we like it. Next month, God willing, we'll arrive, and soon, maybe straight away, we will head down to the water's edge. We will walk along the shore. And do you know what? I can tell you what will happen. The sea will be going out and coming in. The waves will be lapping on the shore, just like last year and the year before that. Think about that. For me, in London this past year, well, it's had its series of ups and downs, highs and lows. There's been stresses and strains. Some things have gone okay. Other things maybe not so well. We've had the upheaval of moving house. But soon, as we walk again along that beach, the sea coming in and out, as it always does, will the last year even have actually happened? All my experiences, my efforts, my stresses, does it make any difference at all? Nothing will have changed. And we could keep thinking, in a few more years, I take it the Glens will have kept on holidaying in the same place. It might even have done it for a generation. Still, that sea will come in and go out. One day, we won't holiday there, or in fact, anywhere. But still, the sea will come in and go out. And as I think about that, and as you think about similar experiences in the world, what effect does that have on us? Verse 8. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. This constant change, yet remaining constant, is actually unsettling, as well as being exhausting. We ask ourselves, are we actually getting anywhere or not? Gaining anything or not? In a year, am I making progress or not? But wearing because I'm suggesting to myself the answer, even if I don't want to admit it. But what I do know is I want more. That's that second half of verse 8. The eye, not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. We want to see more. We want to see the world. So we travel. We see so much. But it's still not enough. We've already heard so much. This information we've received, maybe relationships developed through conversation, but still we want to hear more. It's just not enough. Thinking about this, and we draw some inevitable conclusions, we ask the question, what's new? Verse 9, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Shakespeare's sonnet 59 begins like this. If there be nothing new than that which is, hath been before, how are our brains beguiled? which labouring for invention bear amiss, the second birth of a former child. Well, it's eloquent language, slightly old, but really it's inspired by this Ecclesiastes verse and asking the question, are we just fooling ourselves? As in we search after freshness, originality, newness. But actually, hasn't this all been seen before, been there done that, or at least someone has. It's all just cycling around again. The more it changes, the more it stays the same. There is nothing new under the sun. Verse 10. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. Now, great excitement for some. The Premier League fixtures for the new season have just been released. Others here will need no persuading. That is vanity. But if we are interested, let me ask, why? Because the last season has only just finished. With all its ups and downs and excitements, why start all over again? What does that say about last season? Wasn't it enough? Didn't it really matter? Already is it forgotten? What are those other experiences we have that certainly feel new to us? Let's say you make it to the top of Everest. You see the view from the top of the world. I take it that would be stunning. That would be new to you. 
but there's already a flag there. Thousands of others have been before you, and there's a queue of hundreds waiting to take your place. What about the new discoveries that are made? Well, yes, they are new in a way, but you realize it's yet another discovery like the rest. Yes, there's a glimmer of excitement, but it fades so quickly, someone else replaces it very quickly with a better, more exciting discovery. Or let's say a new record is achieved. Did you hear Ashrita Furman managed to crush 80 eggs in one minute with his head? But who cares? Not just about that one, even the ones that make the news headlines. Did you know there are over 40,000 world records in the Guinness Book of World Records? And on it goes. So yes, maybe we'll witness events that are new to us, but really, does this novelty satisfy? Does it fulfill? After all, the like has been already in the ages before us. So what's new? And so with that, what's remembered? Verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Well, look at us. Here we are in this old building, and uh, we are surrounded by monuments to those who've gone before us. Maybe their mortal remains lie beneath us. And yet, is there, even for these individuals that have been deemed worthy of one of these monuments, does anyone actually remember them? apart from preachers in a sermon. We do care, though, about our legacy, what we will gain, what we're going to leave behind. It's why we work. But the preacher is getting under our skin to ask, who cares? Now, those of us here, let's say, who are a little older, we begin to realize even what seemed so important to us just a few decades ago now doesn't even matter to us let alone to anybody else. And then we think, that calls into questions the future that I'm now working so hard towards. We invest that possible future with such significance, we almost have to, or why bother? But yet, whether we achieve those things or not, the preacher's asking us honestly, will they be remembered? Well, look what's happened in the past. You know the answer. So here we are today. The sun is up. The Thames is flowing. There's a breeze. Tomorrow the sun will rise. The Thames will flow. The wind will blow. But one day, all too soon, the sun will rise. The Thames will flow. The wind will blow. But we won't be there. Not just us. Our generation will go to be replaced by the next. Maybe then we'll be remembered just for a bit, but then the next generation and the next. What remembrance then will there be of us and all our toil? What lasting mark will we have made on this earth? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And in a sense, I think if the preacher was here, he would say, get down, don't say any more. Give them time, give us time to let these words sink in. That we would face squarely these realities of life, of our life. But, there is a but. Although I really don't want to say too much. The preacher wants us to wrestle with these things, to face them, to really feel them. But in the end, the preacher doesn't stop here. There is more, another 11 chapters. But as we reflect on this, these opening verses, and I hope you'll do that this week, we may realize five pointers to where the preacher will in due course lead us. Hence the bullet points that are currently empty on your outline. First, did you notice there is no mention of God in this passage? Now, of course, the preacher knows God. And notice, too, when the preacher speaks of the sun and the wind and the sea, he's not thinking of a merely natural world, as we sometimes call it. He has in mind the world the Creator 
has made. But God is not named explicitly. So what we are seeing here, to put it simply in these opening verses, is that to live in this world with no reference to the creator will lead to despair. Notice the question, secondly. This question of verse 3, phrased in terms of what can I gain, what can we, man, gain by our toil? And that, we know the answer. Left to us, futility. But we wonder, is there another way? A way not dependent on our efforts, our toil, what we do. Because if it is down to us, despair. Third, notice we've already observed, yes, God is missing here. Did you notice who else we don't see? There are generations in verse 4, but then, did you notice, the poem is a ghost town. Where are the people? Let me ask you this question. Did you notice that? Because when it comes to the big questions of life, do we unthinkingly assume it's all about me? My purpose, my achievement, my legacy, my value. In those sort of thinkings, others don't even get a look in. But life focused on self, despair. Fourth, the phrase, under the sun. It's there at the end of that question in verse 3, and again, famously, the end of verse 9. There's nothing new under the sun. That phrase, under the sun, will appear many times in this book. What does it mean? Well, again, like Hevel or vanity, it's not for us to decide for ourselves what that phrase means. So we're going to have to listen in, ponder what the preacher has in mind. But just for now, we can notice it is a restricting phrase. What I mean is, Saying what is under the sun may suggest there is more, what is not under the sun. Although having said that, many today live as if to presume that under the sun is all that there is. But it's living like that that leads to despair. Then fifth, the opening line speaks of the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Now, some treat Ecclesiastes as an abstract, timeless, philosophical treatise. And yes, Ecclesiastes does address fundamental questions of life and existence and meaning. But it does do that as part of a story, which starts with the creation. There was a creation. And then it moves to the history of Israel and her kings and onwards. And ultimately, it's only as part of that story that Ecclesiastes makes sense and helps us to make sense of it all. And talk of a king, a son of David, reminds us that this is a story that has its focus on God's ultimate king, Jesus Christ. And by the end of Ecclesiastes, we will see that without Jesus Christ, there is nothing but utter despair. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. For now, let's pay attention to what we've heard from the preacher from God this afternoon. So yes, reflect on these verses this coming week. There is more to come in the book, and yet it won't completely erase what we see here. Elements of what is described here will still be true of our experience of life under the sun. Much that we will reach for will evade our grasp. Our experiences will often prove beyond our comprehension. There will, for us, be futility and vanity. And so we must feel the force of what the preacher says here. And to do so in such a way that we are driven to keep listening to him in the hope that there is more to come, which there is. I'll lead us in a closing prayer. Father, we do thank you that you created us to experience joy in Christ. And so we thank you for these words to us in the book of Ecclesiastes. Would you help us to listen carefully, to reflect on what we hear? Would we recognize the vanity of life under the sun? And so look all the more to you in the ways that we will hear about in this book. For your glory. Amen.